Welcome everyone to day two of the Words and Music Festival. We're so excited for today's lineup, which includes publishing workshops, panel discussions, musical performances during lunchtime, and culminates in Poets, Pandemics, and Presidents, a reading for these times, featuring 2017 Pulitzer Prize winner Taimba Jess. We are going to get rolling this morning with a workshop that we did last week, and we recorded it for you all, and we're going to be broadcasting it. It is Publishing 101 with Antoinette D.L. Terrace from Pelican Publishing, who will tell you how to take your idea from the Genesis on maybe your Word document to a fully published book in a bookstore. We all need to know this information. It's so valuable to us in this day where you can publish almost anything anywhere. So thank you so much to Antoinette and to the people that participated in the workshop when it was live last week. Also, don't forget that all the agents literacy in New Orleans, year-round public programming, and adult literacy resources provided by One Book, One New Orleans. So don't forget to hit those donation buttons if you haven't already. And I will see you all at the end. Without further ado, Publishing 101. It's a basic guide to the pub basics of it's a basic guide to the pub basics of publishing your book from your big idea to the shelf and hopefully a big space on the shelf. My name is Antoinette Dial Terrace. I'm the PER and marketing director and internship program coordinator for Pelican Publishing. I've been with Pelican Publishing for almost 10 years now. And before that, I was with Walden Books and Borders for way more years than I want to count. And then I worked on the opposite side with uh, contracting for helping people get their books out and also helping with their marketing and their research in between. So that's me. Uh, you may have seen my work because if you've picked up a book by Pelican Publishing in the last 11 years, my writing is on the flap copy. So it's the flap copy you see on the dust jackets of books and it's been an interesting experience to write to other people's words. So we're gonna start with the basics. So I'm gonna share my slides. I apologize if they look wonky. Can everybody see them? It says Publishing 101. Yep. Okay. So the first thing, I'm just gonna give you an overview of what we're gonna look at today. So you kind of have an idea of where things fit for what you need to know. And if there's something you wanna focus a little bit more on, remember just to put it in the chat. I may not see it right away because I've got the screen shared, but I will be seeing it uh, as we go along. So we're gonna cover the introduction, which we just did. The statistics, I'm gonna talk a little bit about book statistics. And then why do you want to publish a book? We have several people on here now who I think are in that mode that want to publish. We're going to talk about writing aids, research, audience, where do you go from there, distribution, marketing, sustainability, and then an overall Q&A. Industry statistics. And Megan, you have, a, you have a website that you can bring up for everybody. And then I'll just kind of read you some of these. The statistics on printed books are pretty astounding. There's a company that uh, Megan's gonna share is Statistia, which does the entire book market. And they, it's definitely a company that you should be familiar with because they give you an overview of what's happening in the industry from how much people are paid, income is of authors, where the best types of markets for books are, everything you can think of. So they go year to year. So the next thing that you'll see is 2020, which will update in November. So right now we have the statistics for 2019. In 2019, 689.45 million units were sold in printed books. Now, I don't know if you guys are fans of digital books, but a few years ago, everyone said that digital books would, would replace print. Not so much. 
65% of people surveyed read at least one print book in the past year, and 40% of those adults had read an ebook in the same period. So you're getting people who are reading both print books and ebooks. So as you're making decisions on what you wanna do with your book, you wanna look at those numbers to kind of see where you wanna be. It's a, big, it's a big market out there, but at the same time, you have a little bit of competition. So the first thing you have to decide is, do you really want to be competing in the most competitive market? And I don't know if any of you know that. The most competitive market in books is romance books. They're the number one published books in the world. So if you're writing a romance, chances are you're not going to be the next bestseller. But if you're writing a specific book in a very small field, you might be the next bestseller or you might be doing really well financially with your book. So why do you want to publish a book? There's lots of different reasons. You know, all of you guys are on here. Maybe you can tell me why you want to publish your book. Are you an entrepreneur or freelancer? Do you have a business you want to use it as a piece for? If you're writing nonfiction, do you want to just tell about a specific time in history? Do you want to get something out there that nobody knows about? Do you want to leverage your skills? Say you're the best person to teach marketing in Louisiana. You want to make sure that everyone knows how to do that. Do you want to tell someone how to build a cabinet? Do you want to talk about what it is that you do best and get other people to pay you to be a speaker or a coach for that? Or do you just have things in your head that you just have to get out? That's, that's usually, for fiction writers, that's more the case. They just have characters screaming in their head that need to get out. But some people have a teaching moment in their life. I have an author that's a really good friend of mine and she worked with her mom who had Alzheimer's and a way for her to get through this was to talk about her experience with her mother through journal entries that became short stories. And now she's got a blog and she has a new book coming out in the next year. Or have you experienced or seen something so amazing that it has to be shared? Like some people have experiences with UFOs. Now, I don't know if you believe this or not. It doesn't really matter. If you had an experience that was so amazing that you just had to get it out, this is a reason to write a book because you're passionate about it. Of course, if you just want recognition and fame, well, you're going to have to figure out what your subject matter is, probably a romance book, but you, you're you probably not going to get these things from a book. Recognition and fame are not what comes from book publishing for the most part. Most authors are undiscovered and unknown. It's a harsh statistic, but it's the case. So once you decide why you want to pu publish a book, then you go into the next phase, which I call the three R's of publishing. And yes, there's a random O there. Let's see, we'll take that out. Writing, research, and arithmetic. Um, there's actually a website with the same name. It's a blog, if you ever go to it, it's hilarious. It's a children's book reviewer. But the three R's of publishing are pretty straightforward. You need to write, you need to research your materials, both your audience and what you've written about. And then you need to do the arithmetic. You need to do the math. How much are you willing to put into publishing a book? How much can you afford to put in? How much are you willing to put into marketing? How much do you wanna get paid for your book if you self-publish? What are you gonna set the price as? If you work with a traditional publisher, how much are you willing to put in of your money to purchase books from them to sell? So you need to really think about those three aspects. So writing. We're going to kind of speed through some of this. Stop me if you want to go slower. You guys have your mics on, so just interrupt me and say, hey, Antoinette, I need you to stop and talk about something. So writing assistance. And you notice that I use the word assistant as in a person as opposed to assistance as in a thing. Because really, the people who can help you the most in writing are people. Not a dictionary, not a library, not a, a writing guidebook or a style guide. It's people. 
It's really important that you connect with other people when you're writing your book, because although people talk about writers being solitary, really, they're not so solitary. You need that feedback from those people around you once you get past the first few sentences. So Megan, you've got a website there, the SCBWI, if you're interested in children's books. This is the Society for Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. The Louisiana Mississippi chapter is what covers us and they're very active and they have a children's book writing conference coming up in the new year. It's free to go to, I believe, but you can find out more on their website. This also is National Novel Writing Month, which is otherwise known as NaNoWriMo. And the people who sign up on this free program, which is sort of a incentivized program to get you to keep writing are called RIMOs. And there's a big contingent of us all across the country. And we encourage each other. We're matched up as but writing buddies. And I believe, Megan, you have that website too. And then there are critique groups. Your local library, even though we're all in COVID and kind of in and out of things, the local libraries still have writing groups and they can assist you in getting connected with them. And one of my favorite incentivized sites is called Written Kitten. And as you write that, uh, I believe you can bring that up too, Megan. As you write, so you use Written Kitten as a journal and you write on that site and every so many words you get, you get, sorry guys. Sorry for the interruption. Um, every so many words you write, you get a kitten. And it's random, it's pulled up from the internet. They enjoy doing them. Uh, the guys who run the website have a blast with it. Your work is not copied anywhere. Um, it's just put on there as a writing aid. Then writing buddies. If you have someone that you know that likes to write the same kind of work that you do, say you write children's books, you wanna get with another children author, say you write science fiction, mysteries, adventure, any of those things, find someone else who's interested in writing. You can do it on Facebook, you can find Facebook groups, you can write your favorite author. There are a lot of Louisiana authors who are fantastic and it's a good chance that some of your favorite authors actually will mentor new authors. So check it out. Then you're going to look for editors, whether you're self-published or traditionally published, having an editor, whether it's just a friend who's really good at grammar to look at your manuscript before you submit it, or it's a paid editor, their assistance is invaluable. You may think you remember all of the grammar rules you learned in uh, middle school, but I will tell you, you probably do not. And there's a huge difference between formalized grammar in Chicago style, AP style, MLA style. So there are a lot of different versions of style guides. And you know, one of the biggest controversies out there is the Oxford comma, which is hilarious if you wanna get into some grammar geekdom. And then beta readers. And a beta reader is a person who reads your book before it's published before you've made revisions maybe. A beta reader should not be your friends, your family, your spouse, your writing teacher. It should be someone who doesn't care if they hurt your feelings. And I say that with the utmost respect because frequently we have authors who bring in manuscripts and they say, but my grandkids loved them. Or they say, hey, the, the guys down at the shop thought this was really interesting. And I have to be the one to break it to them or our lovely editor in chief and say, nobody, you need to, you need to go back and rewrite this. Nobody's gonna read it. And then the last assistant that you really should have in your writing process is a quote provider. And so you've got your book written you've gotten at least a chapter or two in and you send it to a beta reader and then you find somebody who's a specialist in that field. If you're writing a children's book, which you know is the second largest category of books written in the United States, find a teacher. 
that teaches in the elementary school, the age group that you're looking for, or the middle group, middle age group that you're working for, and get them to read what you've written and give you some feedback and hopefully a quote if they like it. So that's your writing assistance. Let's see. The next thing is research, because remember writing, research, and then arithmetic. So your research is really, look, that's interesting spelling. Research. Uh, so your research involves a lot of things. And Megan's got some uh, slides to throw up to. The first one is bookshop.org. And I chose Tubby and Koo's Bookshop because they're a sponsor for Words and Music. So you can look at bookshops to see what other books are out there. And what you're looking for is what kind of covers they have, what kind of content they have, what the inside copy is, if there's a sample for you, what the desk jacket copy looks like, if there's any you know, quotes or blurbs on them, is it somebody you could contact? So you really wanna see how your book is gonna fit in with the other books. Uh, Tubby and Coos is a great example of an indie bookstore there that is a category. So if you're writing, if say for instance, you're writing science fiction or fantasy or YA, she's got a great collection of books for you to take a look at. If you're writing military history or you're writing local history, go to Barnes and Noble, check out the location there. If because of COVID, you're not really leaving your house, go to Amazon. Amazon has so many categories and we all know they're taking over the world in sales. You can browse the top 100 titles in a category you're interested in. And most of those have look inside the book. So you can literally see what the first chapter looks like or the first few pages. And in some of them, they actually allow you to see the first chapter and then maybe a middle section. You see the style of writing. You can compare yours to that. It's a really important portion of writing a book is to compare it to what's out there. If there are other books similar to your big idea, what you need to figure out is how is yours different and how is yours similar? Because you're gonna try and sell your book based on what makes it different and what makes it similar. Of course, if you don't find any books at all like yours, you've got two options. It's a 50-50 shot. Either there's a reason there are no other books because nobody's interested in them, or you have something so unusual that you're gonna be the first one out there. There's no in between on those. If there's no other book similar to yours that's been published since the history of publishing began, you only have two choices. Either it's extremely unusual or nobody wants to read it. So do your research, check out what's out there, look at the markets, look at your statistics. And then the next step is the exciting part, finding your audience. This is really important when you're thinking about the sustainability of your book, because you wanna make sure that you know who's gonna care about your book. If for instance, you're writing history or science fiction or a children's book, well, yeah, that's some of that is self-explanatory. A children's book is gonna be read by children, but is it really? If you're writing a humor book like Cajun Night Before Christmas, it originally started out as a children's book, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that one. That's one of the iconic titles that we have. You can see some of the other ones behind me that are, we are coming out with. But if you're writing a children's humorous book, it may start out as a children's book, but really the people that buy those books are the adults. I don't know a lot of children running around in bookstores with their own money to buy picture books. They usually have a mom or dad they're pulling behind them to buy the book. So you have to walk that fine line of between selling it to the parent and selling it to the child. So your audience for a children's picture book may be their grandma who wants to tell their grandchild about how they lived however long ago, or it may be, we have a book about Alzheimer and it's, it's really um, how to speak to young children about their grandparents who are facing dementia. So those are those kind of books. And then, you know, a history book, if you've got a story about World War II, 
Well, there's a lot of books out there about World War II, but we're still finding new material from released information. We're still finding a few uh, stories that haven't been told. We're uncovering information all the time. Korean War, hardly anybody's written about the Korean War. It's a very small percentage. Vietnam, well, the people who were in Vietnam are now having grandchildren and you know, they're looking for a place to tell their story. Well, your audience could be those people or, or it could be something else. It could be Louisiana history. There's a huge audience for that. We've got a state full of Louisianans who would love to hear more history. And again, you know, if there's, if you're looking for your audience and you don't find any other books like it, like I said before, might there be a reason for that? So remove your ego from the process. When you're looking for your audience, don't say, well, everybody's going to want to read this. Well, who is everybody? That's like that ubiquitous they with a capital T or them. Who are they? Are you going to sell it to your next door neighbor? Well, that's great. Does your next door neighbor want a thousand copies? Because that's what it's going to take to be successful. And I don't know many neighbors that are going to do that for you. So you're going to need to expand your audience beyond friends and family, which is a great first audience. Okay, so self-publishing versus, so we've gotten through the writing, the arithmetic and all of that. We've gotten into the part where you're finding your audience. And so now you've written it, now where do you go? Self-publishing versus traditional publishing. We're gonna talk about three types of publishing today, now that we've gotten through all the basics, and then we're gonna do some Q&A on them. So, in self-publishing, this is a great website, and I think I gave you this one, Megan, selfpublishingschool.com. Did I? If I did, you can pop it up there. If I didn't, you can look at the statistics. So when you're looking at self-publishing, what do you get? Well, you are the sole controller of your book's outcome. You're the sole controller of your book's rights. You have control over this story, you have control over the cover, and you have 100% of the royalties. You don't have an editor, you're gonna to have to pay for that. You don't have a cover design, unless you're really good at graphic arts, you're gonna to have to pay for that. Uh, most people I know, I would suggest that they get someone professional. You're gonna to have to do your own marketing because you're not gonna get that from anybody else. You could hire a marketing firm, you could hire a publicist, you can hire a social media influencer, you can do all of that. On the other hand, you don't have any deadlines. As a self-published author, nobody's telling you when you have to get it done. Now for traditional publishing, you are not the sole controller of your book's outcome. Your publisher is taking all of the risk. They could decide that they publish a thousand copies and those thousand copies don't get sold in the first three months and they're gonna put your book out of stock indefinitely. That doesn't give you the right back to the book. You have to buy those rights or depending on your contract, they may revert to you at a certain point. You're not gonna be the sole controller of your book's rights. Yes, the copyright for your book will be in your name, but you do not have publishing rights for your own book when you publish it through a traditional publisher. So that's why you have to go through your publisher when you ask for things for an article. You can't just send a manuscript or a cover or in, uh, excerpts to a reviewer. You have to talk to your publisher. Control over the story. Well, that's debatable. In traditional publishing, generally, there's an editor on staff. There's certainly an editor here at Pelican uh, Nina Coy is our editor. She's talked to many, many writing groups across the country, and she frequently does reviews externally for groups. The editor here in the building for the company can decide that they want you to change something. You may not want to change it, but it's not your call. It's uh, the call of the publisher because the publisher is the one paying for the book and taking the risk. Now, generally, most editors are going to want to make your book the best it can be because we make the money on the book and we can't sell a book that isn't well written. So really, you again, you need to let your ego go, let the editor talk to you, whether you're self-published or not, let your editor give you information. Now, if you really hate that Oxford comma, 
or you really hate the Chicago style where it's an S apostrophe S for a possessive, you can fight those little details. But when it comes to sentence structure and grammar, unless you're doing colloquialisms or you're doing dialect, you're going to need to pay attention to your editor. Control over the cover. With a traditional publisher, they're going to design your cover based on what they know about the industry and what sells. Do you know what the worst selling book cover is? Something in brown. And I'm sure you guys can all guess why that is. Uh, the first book that Nathan, that John Gilstrap ever published, and he's a top best-selling author now, he's made millions. He came out with a book called Nathan's Run, and it was fantastic. It was an absolutely fantastic book. His publisher, he had a new publicist and a new design group that had just come on board, and they thought the hottest thing to do with this book was put a road on the front of it but they didn't want to make a black road with a yellow line on it or a black road with a white line on it because there was another book out at the same time with that. So they decided they were going to make it a sepia tone, which turned out to be sort of a chocolate brown, to say it nicely, with a yellow line going across it looking like a road. When it got on the bookshelf, it did not display well against the other books and it didn't sell well. People didn't want to pick it up. It's the same concept of, of publishing a book on politics where you want either a red or a blue predominantly featured on the front, or you want red, white, and blue, or for a children's book, you want bright and colorful pictures, or for a romance, you there's a reason they're called bodice rippers. You want that hunky guy or that girl that you know, is wearing a fabulous dress or going off the edge. If you've got a military suspense or fiction, you want those pieces. And so as a self-publisher, you can go out and purchase your own photos or you can do your own photos. I've seen some great self-published books that are photos from the authors. Uh, or you can go out and purchase them or have someone design it. And at a traditional publisher, they're going to incur the cost. For instance, we just did a book with an author and he found a photo he really, really liked. It was owned by someone else and we had to go out and get the rights. Now, the National Archives have tons of photos on file. If you're looking for some photos for your book, you can go to the National Archives and use photos from there. You have to get the permissions. It's a little form. They're generally inexpensive. Some of them as inexpensive as free and some of them uh, 10 to $15, but there's tons of photos. So that's all the projects of the WPA if you're looking for period photos. Or you can go online to Etsy. There are a lot of people that sell photos. There are tons of photo sites that you can do some research and find those things for your cover. Your publisher in a traditional publishing house is gonna give you the opportunity to approve the cover. And if you really hate it, speak up. It's your book. You're gonna be stuck with it for years and years and years. But if you're willing to take the advice of your traditional publisher and you like what they've done, then go with it royalties. Royalties are a tricky subject. So yes, in self-publishing, you get 100% of the royalties, but the royalties are not what your book sells for. So say you're doing Amazon and you went on there for Create Space and you put your book up and you decide in your launch period, you're going to sell your book for 99 cents. Well, you may only get 20 cents of that. You may get more, you may get less, depends on how it sells. You know, every contract is different. They're going to get the rest of it because they're doing the distribution. If you publish with a printer, uh, you self-publish with a printer and say, you know, I'm going to use Kinko's, for example, because they do have a nice program. If you go out to Kinko's and you have a black and white book that's 125 pages and you want it glue bound with a hard binding, you're going to pay as much as $11 per book for that book. Okay, well, now you know your book's got to cost more than $11 when you sell it to someone. The standard rate for a book that size is around $19.95 to 
is that enough to make money off of it when you've also got to pay for your marketing and advertising and running the book around and storing it and shipping it and all of that? I don't know. That's up to you. If you're doing it with a traditional publisher, you're not paying for paper, print, and binding. And that phrase, paper, print, and binding, is an important one because paper is a traded commodity on the stock market, which means that publishers bid on paper in advance of a printing season. So if we know that we're gonna be printing 17 children's books at 32 pages, and we're gonna print a thousand of them each, we know how many reams or how many pounds of paper that we are going to need to have on hand. And we incur that cost. It's a flexible amount. It changes every year. It changes every quarter. It changes month to month. Say we bid on it in June and the price goes up in July. Well, we got to pay that difference in price, but not you because you're going with a traditional publisher. So the editing is included, as I mentioned, in a traditional publisher. The cover design is included. The marketing, that's another gray area. So in the current market, uh, over the last few years, most publishers have gotten to the point where they only spend big money on books that are going to bring them big money. So if you're a new author and you don't have the next absolute big thing, then most likely you're going to be paying for some of your marketing. Now, a traditional publisher is not going to ask you to pay for marketing. They're going to tell you that you need to assume some of these tasks, which invariably are going to cost money. In some cases, they may give you a design for a bookmark. They may do the design work for a bookmark and a postcard, and you may have to print them. Some publishers will print that. You may want a sign at a signing or a banner for a table at a festival. Some, printer, some publishers will do that and some will not. If you're self-published, you're going to incur all of those fees. If you're traditionally published, it may be some of them. Deadlines. Oh, yes. If you're going with a traditional publisher, you need to mind your P's and Q's and get your stuff in on time. Because if you miss a deadline for a season, a publisher is not going to be real thrilled with you. And there are, in some cases, on contracts, penalties for the next step. Okay, I know you probably have questions, so throw them out there um, on the side, and once I shut these slides down, we'll go back and answer them. So I want to go to traditional publishing first, because it's the one I get the most questions on. Do you need an agent? Well, maybe, maybe not. Again, it comes to how much you want to do, how confident you are, and if you think you have the next big thing, or if you think you have a regional thing or a local thing, there are still many publishers who do not require an agent. It's called over the transom, another term that comes from the early years of publishing, where publishing houses had doors with windows at the top of their door, and people would throw manuscripts in at night and they would land, they would go in over the transom and land on the floor, unsolicited manuscripts. If you have an agent, the agent is gonna take a portion of whatever you make. If you don't have an agent, you may have a harder time submitting your book. You never know. So Megan, you've got one more website to show, and this is the AAP, and this is the publisher's organization. You can go to your local library and request this giant book that has a list of all the publishers. It is still published in print because, you know, book publishers. But it is available online, which is much easier for most people. And you can look at the publishers A to Z that are registered with the American Association of Publishers. It gives you information about what kind of books they're looking for, when they require you to submit them, what you need to submit. Um, it usually gives you the website. It gives you an idea of who they've already published. For instance, if you write a military thriller, you're probably going to want to go to an imprint that does something like James Patterson or, you know, some of the other guys. If you write a romance book, you're probably not going to write, go to a sci-fi publisher unless it's a paranormal romance. Uh, if you write a children's book, you're probably not going to go to a business publisher. So you want to make sure that, again, that research is happening. And then you're going to do a query letter. 
So everything that we've talked about before is so important for your query letter, knowing your audience, knowing who's going to like your book, knowing why your book is different than everyone else, knowing all the bits and pieces that you've already researched so that you can be the best marketing person to a publisher as to why you want them to publish your book. And your query letter could be as simple as, my name is John Schmo. I've taught statistics for the last 40 years and I've devised the most effective way to teach statistics to students in the middle grades. And my book is a classroom resource for middle grade teachers. Well, there you go. And here's three teachers who have endorsed my book. And here's two chapters from my book for you to look at. And here's my background and how I plan to market the book. Well, that's your query letter. That's a very effective query letter because you've told them who's gonna buy the book, why your book is so good and you're the expert, and you've given them some testimonials, shall we say, from people who would actually use the book. Now, hopefully those three teachers are in schools where they might even purchase the book. Well, there you go. And then you've told them that you have a marketing plan. You've thought about what you're gonna do afterwards. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that before, before we finish up. Creating your title, that's also kind of a tricky thing. So some people who self-publish just throw out a title. They don't think about it. And then they find that they've published a book and their title is the same title as someone else. That's a bummer. Because depending on what the title is, you could have a real mix up. Uh, we actually, I actually had a friend who published a book not too long ago. She didn't research her title beforehand. It was a business book. And it turned out there was a, uh, I won't say it's a bodice ripper, but it's definitely a sexy story of the same name. No one would have guessed that those titles would have been interchangeable. But every time someone searches for her book, they get that other one because it was out there first. Um, and it has a lot more sales than hers does. So her second book, she changed the title. So that was pretty funny. But you want your book to identify to a reader what it is. If you make your book so unrecognizable that it can't be easily searched, then who's going to find it? If your book is about World War II, use World War II in the title. If your book is a kid's title, it should sound like a kid's title. If your book is a romance book, it should have something that sounds like a romance book. Now, that's not the case with everything. There are certainly lots of books that made it to the bestsellers list that you have no idea what that title, what that story is about from the title. But generally, they have a cover that kind of gives you a hint and they have a great marketing plan. So the next thing that you need when you're going to a traditional publisher is definitely a marketing plan. You really do need one. You need to know how you're going to market. Yes, the publisher is going to give you some guidelines. I mean, that's my job at the publishing house. I'm actually PR and marketing. So I have a whole checklist of things that I do, submitting it beforehand. But I also want to make sure that you're doing it too. Finding endorsement quote providers or blurbers or testimonials is really important for a traditional publisher and for self-publishing. You want experts in the field that you're writing about to acknowledge that your book is exactly that, a book about that field. You want people to see that it's the best thing out there for you uh, to talk about in that one. And then you want to pitch your book as hard as you can to a publisher, whether it's a query letter, whether it's you know, some, some publishers still take print submissions. Most of them now are taking digital submissions, particularly with COVID, you know, we've turned into a digital age. But if you have to ship your package to, uh, to a publisher, make sure your manuscript has been spell checked. That's really important because the worst thing that could happen is your manuscript script gets tossed in a pile, otherwise known as a slush pile. Because it doesn't, it because it stands out for the wrong reasons: bad spelling, punctuation, horrible printing. Uh, nobody accepts handwritten manuscripts anymore. In case you were wondering, uh, submissions, exclusive versus simultaneous. This is an interesting question too, and you're going to have to find out from your publishers that you're interested in. So, an exclusive pub submission means exactly that. 
you've sent a manuscript to one publisher and you've told them that you're not submitting it to anyone else until they decline it, which is generally a 90 day period. Look at the publisher. Again, do your research. Might be more, might be less, might be two weeks, who knows. But you wanna make sure that if you're telling them you're doing an exclusive submission per their guidelines, that that's really what you're doing and you're not hedging your bets and saying, oh, you know, I submitted it to this publisher, but just in case I'm gonna submit it over here. Because what can happen, First off, the publishing world is pretty small. I have interns who've now become professionals in many, many publishing houses, and we talk. There's also organizations for publishers where we get together and chit chat. And if you're a person who's been submitting and you stand out to us in a bad way, we do talk about it. It's not a good way to be recognized. Of course, we talk about the good ones too and gloat that we've gotten you. So once you've submitted it, whether it's an exclusive or simultaneous, there are many publishers that allow you to permit, submit submit simultaneously, you wait. And that could be as much as, that could be as little as two weeks, it could be 30 days, it could be 90 days, it could be 180 days. Some publishers will keep you waiting for a year. So you just need to be aware that while you're waiting, you don't have to stop working. There's lots of things you can do. Now, if you're going self-publishing, which a lot of you may choose to do, uh, this website, selfpublishingschool.com, is fantastic. I don't advocate paying anybody for information because you can get it for free everywhere. But if you want to find a good website about self-publishing, this guy's pretty good. He's talked about a lot of things. He's helped a lot of authors. He has good credentials. But you don't have to pay for it. You can get all the information you need. So. He says the same things I've just told you. Get your feedback, choose a book title, hire a book editor, or you know, if you're really good friends with a high school grammar teacher, go for that too. Give them credit in the book. Some people, that's all they need. Do a book cover. Remember when you're doing your book cover that on Amazon, it shows up at about two inches tall, maybe an inch tall if you're on a mobile phone. So don't do a really art intricate, book cover and expect for people to be able to read it. They've got to be able to see it both on the shelf and on their mobile phones and on their PCs or laptops. So good news for the industry right now. It used to be that Amazon required your, e your book to be uploaded in a Mobi format. I know that's tech speak to you unless you're really a geek like me. Uh, but when you're looking at publishing your book and self-publishing, you're going to have to educate yourself on these things, how to create an EPUB, how to create a Mobi format. Well, Amazon, as of last month, has realized that the rest of the industry, industry is getting more eBooks than they are. Uh, there's a growing glut of eBooks on private sites because they can go in EPUB. So Amazon decided that they needed to get on the bandwagon because they were losing money. And they will now take an EPUB file too. So it's pretty straightforward. You set up an account, you upload it, you add your cover, you do whatever. Uh, with Amazon, your ebook is available immediately and your book is what we call print on demand. So they don't print 100 copies of your book. What, it, what, most, um, what most of those type of self-publishers do uh, companies that you'll get to publish for you, they will print it as you need it. So you don't have to stockpile a lot of books. Now, there are some companies, say you go to Kinko's, you may have to get 100 books before you get a discount on it to get it below that $11 a, a book charge, in which case you've got to find some place in your house to put all of those cases of books. But that's your choice, because remember, every penny of that book that you self-publish goes to you as opposed to a, a royalty. Pricing your book in self-publishing. You have options in self-publishing. In self-publishing, you can price your book at 99 cents in the first two weeks. You can up the price to 2.99. You can go up to 5.99. You can keep moving your price up until you hit sort of where people stop buying it. In traditional uh, publishing, the book is priced by the publisher 
so that they can figure out how they're going to get everybody's pieces out of the pie. And that's the price it's going to be, if anything, is going to go up uh, when it reprints. So forming a launch team, that's pretty much the same for both of them. Maximizing the launch exposure, celebrate publishing a book. Those are all kinds of things you do for both. So we're going to go to the next one. Hybrid publishing, sponsorship. This is sort of a cross, exactly as it sounds, a cross between traditional publishing and self-publishing. Tubby and Coos has a program where they solicit, uh, Candace solicits, it, solicits manuscripts and they look at them and then they choose if they wanna sponsor them and then they go through a printing program and they print them and then they are the exclusive provider for the book in the store. There are other stores that do that through an Ingram Spark program. Say you have a history book about Mississippi. Hopefully you don't, hopefully you're a Louisiana writer, but hey, if you've got one about Mississippi and it's about Biloxi, well, there are several bookstores in Biloxi that work with Ingram. So the program there in Ingram Spark is that you get a bookstore to commit to buying 500 copies of your book and selling your book in their bookshop. And it could be that three bookstores go together, whatever. The manuscript goes through like a traditional manuscript because it's going through the Ingram publishing program, but you've committed to buy so many and the bookstore is committed to buy so many. And then, you know, it's sort of a hybrid thing, half, half self-publishing, half marketing through Ingram because Ingram creates catalogs and they sell it to other places and they do all of that. You can do a Kickstarter. I know a lot of published authors who do Kickstarters. Uh, you can do GoFundMe, you can do Facebook, you can do all of that. Distribution. We're going to zoom through these so we can get to the questions because we only have about 15 minutes left. So getting it on the shelf, that's part of what traditional publishing will do for you. If you self-publish a book, getting it on the shelf is a tough proposition. You're going to put in the legwork, you're going to walk around the streets, you're going to go store to store with your bag of books, and you're going to promote yourself to them and tell them why they should have it on their shelf. Might be an easy sell, might not, but you're going to be doing the legwork. If you have a wholesaler like Ingram or you're working with Amazon or you're working with those, they're going to give you that asset. Okay, marketing, big part of this. Pre-publication things to do while you wait. Build a following, social media. If you're an author, you should have an author's professional Facebook page. It doesn't cost you anything. You don't need a website. That's kind of passe these days, but you do need a Facebook page. You can do everything you want to do from a Facebook page. You can market, you can sell, you can promote, you can do live streams, you can do events, you can do all of it. You want to create buzz, you want to provide teasers, cover reveals, endorsements, beta reader reviews, online forums like Wattpad and a few other places where you can publish parts of your work. Beware, because that may mean that they now have the rights to your material. You want to protect your rights. Copyright is an interesting thing. Do your research, know what Creative Commons and publishing copyright law is for your state, and your type of book, because there are different ones. And then develop your launch team. Your launch team is people who support you as you're getting ready to publish your book. Oops, go on there. Remember I said research? You're gonna be doing research for the rest of your life. So post-publication, announce your birthday. You guys did something. I'm hoping you're all gonna publish books and I get to be cheerleaders for all of you. Use your influencers, if that's teachers who write reviews, or if that's a social media influencer who loves cats and your book is photos of cats at home during COVID, get them to put your book out there. There are lots of resources to find influencers. Teasers, how much is too much? You don't want to put out more than 10% of your book in a public domain because first off, you want them to buy the book. You don't want to give it away. If you have 200 recipes in a cookbook, you don't want to give away 20 recipes out of that cookbook. You want to do five or six recipes and reuse them in different formats. Or use recipes that are not in your cookbook and say, well, here's a sauce that you could use with this lasagna recipe that's in my cookbook. Again, protecting your rights. Make sure 
you're protecting your rights at every turn. Don't send PDFs of your manuscript or your book through email to anybody. I cannot tell you how many Far, far Eastern printers and Asian printers and Russian printers have stolen books from authors in the United States because they grab them off of emails. Printing rights. Remember we talked about traditional versus self-publishing and I said self-publishing, you hold all the rights. You're, you hold the copyright either way, but in a traditional publishing, your publisher has the right to reprint the book or print it. Launch teams, the value of networking, events, incentives, read alouds, how much, where, how long, do your research, speaking and selling, ad infinitum, these things go on and on and on. It never stops. So one more. Sustainability, and then all we have is questions. So I think we have 10 minutes. So long-term viability for your book. If you write a book, which I hope all of you do, and you publish it, which I hope all of you do, no matter which way you do it, self-publishing, traditional or hybrid, you want it to live for a long time. And ways to do that is to make sure that you're continually marketing your book, whether you're with a traditional publisher or not, it's your primary job to be passionate about your book. If you're not passionate about it and you quit promoting it after it goes to a publisher, why should they do anything about it? Once they sell the original copies they sold, they're done with it, unless you're an active promoter. One way to sustain your book is print it, do it in a print book first in hardcover, then come out in a paperback. This was the way the industry lived for generations up until the last decade. Now things come out in paperback or ebook first, and then they, they never have a hardcover. Do format changes. Like I said, hardcover to paperback to ebook. Do a sequel. If you wrote about the beekeeping, as another friend of mine did, she did the thinking beekeeper. And then she did more from the thinking beekeeper. It was a great strategy because it comes up when you look at the first book. It's, it's right there as a related title. Do a sequel. Say you have a character you love in a children's book. Do that sequel of the next adventure. Uh, we do lots of books like that. It, Gaston in Cajun Night Before Christmas has about 20 sequels. They're not all in print anymore, but the ones that are are really popular. Uh, we have several books that are like that. Uh, you know, when you look at John Grisham or you look at James Patterson or you look at Nora, uh, Nora Roberts, any of those authors who have long-term careers, they've looked at sequels and sustainability. Say something changes in your industry. Say you are a business person and your first book is about publishing books. Well, there's new things in the industry. Do a revision or a new edition. And then of course, there's writing the new book. And now I'm going to close this and we're going to go to questions. So I got lots of questions. Uh, okay. Is there a difference between a quote and a blurb? Yes. So a blurb is an endorsement. It could be a quote. It could be an excerpt from a review. It happens before, a blurb happens before the book is published because you want it on your book. And, and many publishers will use these terms interchangeably, endorsement quote, testimonial, blurb, all of that. Uh, let's see, cover letter, yes, a query is like a cover letter. It's a little bit more extensive, but it's the exact same thing. And particularly in a digital age when we're doing uh, digital submissions, it is literally a cover letter because you're going to attach everything else to that. Is it okay after a certain period of time to contact the publisher? Absolutely. If you haven't heard from a publisher in 30 days and they told you that the exclusive submission was 30 days, you have the right to contact them and say, I gave you the 30 days to look at this. Are you still considering my book? or can I go submit it elsewhere? Or you can simply, if you think your book is strong enough, you can literally say to them, I gave you ex exclusivity for your required 30 days and now I'm gonna simultaneously submit. Eh, is it frowned upon? Well, it depends how much you wanna be with that publisher. Uh, 
how to make a title work. Hi, Christopher. Yes. Uh, yeah. Further tips on titles. Well, you can do a keyword search. So you can do the top trending words in or, or hashtags in Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and good Lord, there's so many out there. Uh, you can sort of do a keyword search on all of them and they'll pop up in whatever your field is. You can pop up the no, most used words. And then I say, go to a thesaurus and see what you can find on there. Uh, you know, a lot of things that you could find, Christopher, on titles is you can actually look at other books that are in the genre. Um, what type of books do you write? Or are you thinking about writing? Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming it's okay if I unmute for this, right? Absolutely. Um, I don't know. I feel like they kind of tend to fit into like crime-esque stuff, either mystery or thriller or somewhere along that boundary line. No. Are they are they like noir books where you want to sort of give a you know a, a phrasing to it that gives that that idea right. or that feel? Or if they're more uh, thriller kind of things where you want a little bit more excitement. So think about in your head, if you're doing a if you're doing a sentence and you want to take out the most exciting part of it, like the verb and an adjective and then the object of the verb. That gives you a really exciting title that people are gonna look at and in their head, they're gonna supply the rest of it. They're gonna supply the punctuation, they're gonna supply the, you know, the object, all of that. But that gives you uh, a, a better way to sort of read it. And I recommend reading things out loud. So if you're looking at the top 100 books in your category on Amazon, look at those and then look at the bottom 100 books because a, a lot of times it's not because the, because the book is bad it's because the title is horrible or it's not searchable or it didn't it didn't come up in a way you like and when you're uh, part of the searchability for a book is not just the title it's the summary about the book and that's part of your marketing and we could probably do a whole nother class on marketing but when you're looking at the summary of your book you want to use those keywords. So if your book is a thriller and it's a political thriller and it's noir, it's what there's several ways to do that. You can compare it to another book and say for fans of, and then of course, every time that book gets searched, your book is going to come up too. It may not be in the top level, or you could use words that they use. So you could say, in the darkest night, you know, someone comes out and there's a murder, or whatever. You can give some phrasing there that makes it exciting. Does that does that make sense? Okay. Uh, Elizabeth, how would you send your manuscript to a publisher digitally if you can't send it through email? You can send your manuscript to a publisher digitally, but what I'm saying is after you have a PDF of that in a final book version, that's what you don't want to send. And you can, instead of sending it digitally to them directly, you can use Dropbox. Almost everybody in the industry uses Dropbox. And you can literally host it online, give permission to that editor to access it. Ask the editors, you know, if you're, you know, look at their guidelines because most of them say exactly how they want you to do it. Uh, let's see. Any marketing companies you recommend or prefer for self-publishers? Well, do your research. A lot of them charge you a lot. Ask them to talk to some book authors that they've worked with. Ask them to show you their work. Because there's a lot of people out there who give information, but they don't really back it up. And you can, I mean, if you want to consult with somebody, there's several consultants in the area. I'd go to the book organization. Like, um, so what type of books do you write? This is under Vampire Friendly. So uh, what type of books do you write? Because marketing companies do different things. Uh, one book, historical nonfiction, regional. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, there are some, so the Women's National Book Association is a local group. 
there's a New Orleans chapter. It's not just open for women, it's open for anybody. It is the one of the oldest publishing organizations in the United States. It was established in 1926, the same time as Pelican was. And it is designed to help network between marketing and writing and illustrating. So those are great resources. There's some marketing people that belong to that program and you can network amongst them and get recommendations from other authors who have the same type of books that you have. That's what I'd look at is people who market the same type of books you have because it's a fine line between competition and co-opetition. And co-opetition is where you're, it's a cooperative endeavor. You're, you have books that are similar and your sales on one is gonna increase the sales on the other. Whereas co-opetition, you're totally separate and you, you don't share resources and you don't share anything. I find that co-opetition in the book industry is much more successful because if you have a book about local history, chances are the person who's buying your book also bought another book about local history. The Historic New Orleans Collection publishes local history. They're well known for their publishing in that field and they have some great books. So that's a resource for you as well. It depends what kind of history you do. Of course, you know, I'm with Arcadia publishing the History Press and Pelican. So you know, that's our field too. Uh, but if you wanna self publish, then you're gonna to wanna to look at networking to get some recommendations. All right, any other questions? I feel like there's tons more to talk about. Did I miss something that someone really wanted to know? No? Okay. Well, I believe as Megan mentioned at the beginning that this is gonna be recorded. Uh, if you are interested in contacting me directly, my email is really simple. I'm not gonna give you my publishing email because I don't want you to email me at work unless you're submitting to Pelican. But my personal email is hostess for hire nola at gmail.com. And it's all spelled out hostess, H O S S T E S S F O R H I R E N O L A at gmail.com. You can send me an email if you have any further questions, or you can join us again on the 20th when we're going to play this recording and I'm just going to host it so that uh, if anyone has questions, I can literally answer them as we're going through it, which, oh, sure. You know what? I'll type it in. How about that? I can't type and talk at the same time. There you go. Okay, there you go, Christopher. Uh, so if you're interested in talking, I'm available to discuss things. If you wanna see it again and you will have more specific questions, you can send them to me in advance and I'll make sure I cover them in the Q&A and we'll go from there. So I think that wraps it up for today. Thank you guys for coming and get your books published. Thank you so much, Antoinette, for that really informative and thorough Publishing 101. I cannot believe you covered so much in an hour. At 10.15, we will have Immortal Lives in Speculative Fiction, which will be an incredible conversation moderated by Alex Jennings, who probably knocked your socks off at the Podunk Review Issues 3 and 4 celebration last night, if you were watching that. Don't forget that this festival is accessible on a donation basis. So you can support the festival words and music NOLA at gmail.com on PayPal. Text WAM20, WAM20 to 44321. And also in the comments section, you can click the link. And all of these will work even if you're not watching live. If you're watching the video later, they still work. So don't feel like you missed out on the opportunity to support us just because you weren't catching the live broadcast. We will see you again in 10 minutes. Take a break, get some food, enjoy. We're coming back soon. Bye. <laughs>